and the SBI, there are six days to get it done before ministers arrive. <coughs> ministers will then have two days to take issues forward before leaders arrive. This means that there are a total of eight days to prepare a workable package that consists of both immediate and long-term components which leaders can endorse on the 18th of December. The time for formal statements is over. The time for restating well-known positions is past. The time has come to reach out to each other. I urge you to build on your achievements, take up the work that has already been done, and turn it into real action. I'm going to give a little bit of an update of sort of the inside of the, what's happening at the uh, UNF Triple C at the Bella Center. And the Kyoto Protocol track is what you would think. It's um, for developed countries to take on reduction commitments um, under the Kyoto Protocol. Each, uh, there's, it's divided into commitment periods. So the first commitment period was 2008 to 2012. And right now what they're supposed to be doing is negotiating commitments for developed countries for 2013 to, it's not defined the end, it could be 2017, it could be 2020, we, that's part of the negotiation. But what's happened is, is none of the developed countries have actually taken on any commitments, either in aggregate to say, for example, developed countries are supposed to be you know, at least 40 or 45 percent below 1990 levels by 2020 in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions. And they haven't taken on individual commitments. So the U.S., for example, hasn't said, ah, we're going to reduce our emissions by 75 percent. The United States doesn't want to take on anything that's internationally binding. They want it to be what's called bottom-up, so that every country just says, oh, with our domestic legislation, we're going to reduce this amount, and we're going to reduce that amount. And it doesn't matter whether it is um, what society calls for or what justice calls for, it's just what we're going to do. And, there's, and we're going to show it to the rest of the world and that's it. So it's called Pledge and Review. Some people call it Show and Tell. And make no mistake, Denmark is committed to maximum progress in the two tracks. The Convention track and the Kyoto Protocol and to ensure a successful and ambitious outcome. Let's get it done. Danish Prime Minister, who has taken over from Connie Heldegard, who is the president of the COP, of the Conference of Parties, she's Danish, he's taken over from her, and he wants to collapse the two tracks, and he's, he's really working to find a compromise between what the EU wants and what the US wants, and it really doesn't matter what developing countries want out of this. Um, and so right now what you're seeing is, for example, um, France and the UK have been um, lobbying very hard Ethiopia, uh, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, to say accept this deal from the EU, which is calling for 100 billion euros a year in long-term financing, which maybe if you are not familiar with the need, it sounds good. But, you know, an estimate right now of the need for um, developing countries to deal with climate change to both mitigation and adaptation, meaning reducing greenhouse gas emissions and adapting to the unavoidable impacts of climate change. Um, the UN right now is saying it's 500 to 600 billion dollars a year. So talking about 100 billion euros a year is way too low, plus a lot of that money comes from the private sector. It's market-based. The majority of it actually is not public money from developed countries. The Ethiopian Prime Minister just came out in support of this EU package, but he's not speaking for Africa. The Africa group within the negotiations has a very firm position. They are calling for fast start financing, meaning pre-2012, of $400 billion a year. They're calling for long-term financing of 5% of global GNP by developed countries. So uh, many, 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 many negotiators from Africa are extremely upset at the undermining that's being done by, by France in courting Ethiopia. And now we heard that President Obama has been calling Bangladesh. He's called Ethiopia. He's trying to buy off countries. 
um, because he'll be swooping and he'll be coming tomorrow, and Secretary of State from the U.S. Hillary Clinton is here today. Um, what we also see is developing countries really trying to hold strong. So, for example, over 100 developing countries have now called for no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature rise, a return to 350 parts per million, reductions of at least 45% below 1990 levels by 2020 by developed countries, and then much larger quantities of, of financing. And then at the head of the pack we have Bolivia, which has called for reductions of at least 49% below 1990 by 2017, and no more than one degree Celsius temperature rise. <laughs> The red is a mechanism that says we can, because of the deforestation, uh, the emissions resulting from deforestation in tropical forest, it's not boreal forest, it's, not, it's only the tropical. By the way, the very fertile you know, and competitive areas in the tropics uh, would be the cheapest, easiest, and fastest way to reduce emissions. So instead of uh, like um, discussing how to cut in the source or how to do the energy efficiency transition, we should right now start to pay for the countries to stop deforestation. Okay. It, the whole point is you have to pay to reduce deforestation. But who are the drivers of deforestation? Is the industrial agriculture. We are not discussing, for example, a, a key issue for reducing emissions that would be to dismantle the entire crazy and freaky agribusiness system that we have today in the world. Because if you count all the fossil fuels that are used to open the land, to heavy machinery, to all the produce, the chemicals and the fertilizers, and then to carry to truck and to ship and to fly around all the food, this already would be this major cut. But this is not on the table. The industrial agribusiness sector now wants to receive carbon credits for doing the nice thing of no-till agriculture. But we know that no-till agriculture can, it's used in Brazil to expand GMO soy, GMO cotton. There is no no-till peasant agriculture. There is agroecological uh, system where you work with the land and with the biomass, but the no-till is a trick. And then in, the, in this bag of bad things that they have, there is also the biochar, this fanatic idea of growing eucalyptus, burn the eucalyptus, and bury the carbon stored in the, in the charcoal in the land. I mean. Consensus means that any agreement here can only aspire to the lowest common denominator amongst us. From our perspective, in the face of this growing whirlwind of disaster, making decisions based only upon the lowest common denominator is beyond irresponsible. It's gravely negligent. So while we must always work to achieve consensus, we must have an orderly method to move forward in the rare occurrences where consensus is not possible. Therefore, subject to one small change, we requested alternative A for Rule 42. I think that you'll be a little canvas with trust. I think that trust is something that you have. It's not something that you'll give. And certainly this process still has to have my trust.
matter of fact, there are institutions that says climate change is a business opportunity, which in fact it is a business opportunity also. And also other people, they just want to continue business as usual and trying to find some clever way to make other people believe that they are contributing to solve the climate change crisis. And then some of us feel that uh, if we want to solve uh, the climate change problem, we have to go to the roots of the problem. And that has to do with questioning a political and economic system that puts profits ahead of the environment and profits ahead of people. We love green, but we love profit more. We say power shop. They say coal stop. We say power shop. Cap and trade has all kinds of flaws, but one of them is the negotiating dynamic. What it ends up doing is putting nations and industries and regions in a competitive war over allocation of the remaining carbon that we can emit and maintain a planet that's livable. And as long as there's this planetary food fight going on, we won't reach any kind of usable agreement. And in fact, the food fight will never end. Um, instead, as you might guess from the name of my organization, what I think we need to do is agree to price CO2 emissions. And I don't think we even need to agree internationally on the same price. If we set a price in a, in a large block of countries, for example, the United States would be big enough to do that, or the European Union, other countries would have an incentive to do the same thing because of the World Trade Organization provisions that require, that allow what's called a border tax adjustment. So for example, if the US were to impose a carbon tax, and what I'm talking about when I say a carbon tax is a tax on coal, oil, and natural gas at the first point of sale, a carbon tax, which could be harmonized internationally, would get us where we need to go without this bad dynamic that is a struggle over allowances and allocation and formulas, etc., that really will never reach an agreement. We're selling dirty air, we buy clean air, do we care if it works? No, we don't. I'm invited to fund your favorite false solution. Come and fund agrofuels, come and fund nuclear, come and fund large dams, hydro, come on, CCS, we've got it all, we're selling it all. I think the best outcome we can hope for is a stalemate, um, meaning no agreement, because if anything comes out by tomorrow, it's going to be it's going to be really bad based on what we're seeing so far. So I think if there's if it looks like a failure because of developed countries, I think that's the best outcome we can hope for, and then try to work for something better. But we have to be very careful about the spin around this because they're going to say that either China or the G77 in China blocked progress. James Hansen, who's the leading climate scientist at NASA, uh, made a very strong statement in, in, in the international press where he said, I want these talks to fail. And he wanted them to fail because he could see no prospect that a strong agreement would be produced. And we've heard this from Polly as well. I have to say I'm inclining in that direction myself. Barring some thunderbolt miracle where Barack Obama is struck from on high, by, by whatever divinity we choose to believe in and suddenly he starts speaking in tongues and pouring from his mouth are all the things we would like to see in a climate agreement including a declaration of planetary rights. Um, is the agreement going to be um, so bad that it's better not to have an agreement at all? We must have the sense that the world's governments are committed to the 350 or whatever it's the science takes. We need that as a declaration at the very least, otherwise there isn't a foundation to move forward. If it's just shambolic and chaos as it is at the moment, it'd be too depressing and it won't form any sort of global mandate for the next steps. I sympathise with that, but the problem with, with all these good intentions is that if we have something on paper, people tend to become complacent. They say, oh wow, we formulated this, it's a great document, like Kyoto in one way full of good intentions and nothing's really coming out of it. We need something that actually makes us or empowers us to change our ways. Anybody in this room who think 
that the Harper government is in that category of governments, progressive governments doing everything they can to, to reduce emissions? I, I don't think so. We are here to tell the Canadian government that they have been lying to us because they have been telling us that they are going to reach their targets and that they're going to increase the strength of their targets over time. Speaking of draft text that said that the government was going to put even less ambitious targets on the table was so unacceptable to us as Canadian youth. Canada is already at the back of the pack in these international negotiations. Nations is violating their own laws, the Geneva Convention, the August Convention, and God knows how many conventions they have signed and uh, uh, promoted in the past, and now they are violating their conventions. It is the, the United Nations that is excluding dissenting voices to the process. We need a change in the model of civilization. Actually, we need a change in the model of production and consumption. With, with the reductions they proposed to get to two degrees, so the 25 to 40 percent below 1990, which is now based on old science and was already conservative to begin with, that still leaves us with a 50-50 chance of overshooting two degrees. And the Africa group, actually, the bloc of African countries in, in the negotiations has been very strong in saying, for them, two degrees is suicide, because two degrees global increase is actually 3.5 degrees in most of Africa. And even then, when, when like the EU or the US or Australia or whichever um, developed country talks about two degrees, they're, they're talking about it on paper. So it's going to be achieved with billions and trillions of tons of offsets and tons of loopholes and people getting money to do things that aren't even real. So their two degrees isn't actually really two degrees. It's more than two degrees. Whereas those who might invest in the future in renewables, if the price is right and if the market conditions are correct, have a much less powerful interest because they don't actually have anything to defend at the moment. They're not going to lose their livelihood if renewables don't take off. They might not just be able to exploit new opportunities. And while there is no overall limit on the amount of fossil fuel that is extracted, that extraction continues to undermine all the other goals which have been expressed by the Conference of the Parties. And it's extremely hard to limit demand if you're not limiting supply, because the price of fossil fuels remains very low, that undermines the alternatives, that creates a very major incentive to, to um, uh, uh, not to move out of them, um, as far as the remainder of the economy is, is concerned. So my two proposals, which I, I really I beg people to take up, uh, for what, what a good climate agreement would contain, a leave trees standing and leave fossil fuels in the ground. So stunned and, and disappointed about the failure, about everything what is going on here in the Bella Center. And that's why we are going to shave our heads tomorrow morning in front of the Bella Center. And we are realizing that we are not going to achieve anything with action and with crying and shouting. And so we, we said, okay, we have to do something else, but we want to express our disappointment, our anger, and and our fear as well, um, and that's why we are going to shave our heads. And I have some information here and I will put it somewhere there on the table. We are taking back the power. And as we march in the flood, we are showing that we are a force that cannot be stopped. destiny in our hands and so when we begin to move.